Hello, this is Real World Audio, and we are looking into our hearing. And what do we know, need to know about human hearing as audiophiles? And I think this is an exceptionally important subject for us because uh, when you look into how we hear and how the brain processes the acoustic information, I would say that's about 50% of the picture that you need to design a good audio system. And today we are in that very unfortunate situation that the engineers who design uh, audio gear, they are pretty much in the electronic department or electric department. And when you have better engineers, they also look into the acoustics. Uh, and th that goes for uh, loudspeaker manufacturers who are not just looking at the electrical parameters, but the acoustical parameters, how they work. And uh, those engineers who look into electrical, acoustical, and how the brain interprets sound are extremely rare, uh, almost non-existent, but it is absolutely vital uh, to know about this subject and that is the key for several things for one of the things is how to uh, find a system how to put together components to match your personal preference and your uh, level at which you listen to music so let's get into it so as a start, I have here for you two guys, uh, which respect uh, two very different aspects of uh, how we approximate music, how we, how our hearing works. And one of these is a modern scenario of a DJ, and uh, and and for that. Uh, you will see that the person who is in a club spends his nights there, his hearing, his audio auditory system is pretty much burned out because of the constant exposure of extremely high uh, volumes. And the other extreme would be Maestro Toscanini, and and he I brought him up as an example. I know Craig that you are not a fan of Toscanini, um, but uh, he is an ultimate example for a golden ear. So I don't know how much do you know about uh, Toscanini's life, about uh, musicians, like how their hearing was. But Toscanini was an absolute legend about his hearing and he was the conductor who was totally nuts about dynamic contrast. So I think there hasn't been a single conductor since Toscanini who was so intent on dynamics and the volume at which the individual musicians play. And he could spot out basically anyone uh, here even if they, uh, the the orchestra was playing together and one member was not playing at the right volume even just a tiny bit off he would go berserk and 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 and, and make hell the life of that person during that uh, the preparations for that performance so he would be uh, the extreme golden ear who can handle from the softest whisper to the loudest thunder and his hearing is on par and the or dj would be that person who would represent the majority of audiophiles today which is a person with severely compromised hearing and now let's see what is the actual difference between the two. So here I have the ISO equal loudness contours. And I know, I think uh, most of you know about the Fletcher Munson curves, uh, which uh, were uh, measured and uh, early in the century, I would say, <laughs> uh, early for us now. 
but a very long, almost like a century ago. And uh, but since then, there were additional measurements done to make it better. And the ISO standards are the ones which we currently use. Uh, let's just check out the ISO standards website. And that's the uh, ISO standard for the acoustics, normal, equal, loudness, levels, and contours. If, if you want to pony up, you can pay for it and check it out for yourself. And when you look at it, the previous version was issued in 1987 and the current one is the 2003 and it says standard is reviewed every five years and its current stage is to be revised. So basically it's almost two decades overdue. But what we have between the previous ISO standard and the current standard is 16 years difference. So basically that's almost a generation. So what happened during a generation? So let's go back here. So this uh, comparison is actually from uh, Wikipedia. They did uh, something really nice here that, that will help us tremendously. So with the red lines, we see the curves uh, from uh, 2003. And as a comparison for the 40 phone level curve, uh, they have with blue the curve from the previous standard. And what you can uh, notice here is that uh, the, the, with the previous curve, the shape of the curve, how uh, the hearing differs for mid-range perception versus base perception and high-end perception, it has, uh, if you see that with going for different loudnesses, so when we are listening to very loud levels, so 100 phone is, uh, you, we could say it's like equivalent to a 100 dB level, but that 100 dB, that is only at about uh, kilohertz or so. So if we go higher or lower than that, then we would look at that at a 2, 3 kilohertz, we would need less than 100 dB to have the impression that it has the same loudness as that kilohertz sound. Uh, but if we go higher than 4 kilohertz and we go like 10 kilohertz, then we would need much higher. How much higher? 10, 15 dB higher sound pressure at 10 kilohertz to, to have the same impression that we are hearing it at the equal volume as we hear a 1 kilohertz note. And the same is true for bass, especially when you go below 200 hertz. So between a kilohertz and 200 hertz, our hearing is flat at the 100 phone level, and then it starts to rise up. So when you go to 20, d 20 hertz, then you need 30 dB higher sound pressure level to get the same impression that the bass is as loud as the 1 kilohertz signal. And and this, why is that so? That's because our human hearing, you see, this is where it's most effective at the two, uh, 2 to 5 kilohertz range. And that's because that is where the children are uh, most active and that's where the babies are crying. So our ears are uh, genetically evolved in such a way that we are most sensitive to children's voices. So it means that even if the kids are far away and they get into trouble, then you can hear and locate them most easily. And that was absolutely necessary for the survival of our species. And if it would not be this part of the curve, probably there would not be a human culture on Earth. So this is a key to our success. And look at that. For the quietest part, uh, then when you uh, look at, like, let's say a two, three phone level, then when for kids, we can hear even below zero dB. 
so our sensitive is that that uh, that much geared towards hearing them. But what you can notice another thing that we can read from this curve is that the the way the base curves up is different at each level. So this is when you are speaking at a whisper soft level. This is more like a normal conversation level. This is conversation level at a, at a noisy workplace. This is shouting and this is it's so loud that it's uh, not hurting yet, but uh, it's uh, extremely loud, like a concert level loud. And the difference between them is when it's super loud, then uh, to hear the deep bass at the same level as the mid-range, you do not need that much bass. Look at that. At this 100 phone level, to hear 20 hertz the same level, you need 30 dB more higher level for 20 hertz. But if you are at whisper soft, to hear the 20 hertz as loud as you hear the, let's say, 2 kilohertz, you need 70 dB louder 20 hertz in comparison. And for example, this is the key. This is how the loudness uh, setting works on amplifiers, which have them and preamps, because when you engage loudness, then for quieter music, it bumps up the level of the bass and it bumps up the level of the highs so that your brain will uh, think that you are listening to music at a louder level with a balanced EQ that you would get at a more higher setting. However, without that, that uh, loudness controls, if you just listen to music, that's how you can tell that whether you are listening to it at the volume where they recorded it. So when they record it at a certain volume, the music will get its certain shape that adapts to that equal loudness contour of that volume. And if you want to play it uh, louder or quieter, then that contour does not match the contour that is for that level. So that's why when you get a lot of uh, rock music, and especially concert recordings, if you listen to them at home, at a medium volume, that's why there is no bass in it, there's no highs in it, because it has this type of contour and you are trying to play it at this setting. So there you have basically a flattened out bass and a flattened out top end, and that's why you do not hear enough bass and enough high frequencies. So that's why if you have a Rush album, you have to play it at max volume to get the same uh, EQ where it's uh, intended to be played at. Of course, you cannot just play it at any time. You have to be... Uh, um, for most people, the family setting does not allow a live rock concert volume. So you have to be mindful of that that uh, the recording itself will be the greatest boundary to enjoy it at your home. And uh, yep, and that's a good thing to keep in mind. But the second thing which is really crucial and why I started with uh, Maestro Toscanini and or DJ is because the change that has happened between 87 to 2003. And that change is not because our measurements have uh, improved during 16 years. Uh, it's basically using the same technology. Uh, if you think that uh, measuring technology every year is just eclipses so much that you cannot compare next year's data from previous data, that's, uh, that's not how things are. But what the change in these curves show us is that what was the change that has occurred during those 16 years? So you see in the mid-range we have a similar sensitivity, but uh, to have the same equal contour, the same hearing, both for high frequency and low frequency, 16 years later we need 
about uh, 20 fold higher curved. Uh, so, so those curves that correspond to the 60 fold would correspond quite well to that blue curve. So basically what this means is that during those 16 years, uh, the average human's hearing is 20 dB worse than it was before. So, and, and, and this data, 2003, is almost two decades old. So if we were to do the curves today, the ends would be curving up even more than they have curved here. So that's why I showed this as a big warning for everyone that to show you a tendency that as, uh, as mankind, as society, that there is a general tendency that uh, we are not taking any good care of our hearing and uh, we are going uh, more deaf by each passing decade. And as an audiophile, your number one responsibility is for your ears, because without your ears, this hobby is literally nothing. Then it becomes just a comparison of hearing aids, which is... Uh, not as much desirable as the ability to enjoy music. So my lesson here about the hearing is just take very, very good care of your hearing and make sure that uh, when you listen to music, you pay great attention to how your ears uh, feel after your session and if you have listening fatigue then that's a disastrous indication it means that 10 years from now you will be able to enjoy only a fraction of what you can enjoy today because listening fatigue indicates that you are destroying your hearing let me repeat that again as a medical professional that because if you don't know, I am a medical professional. If you have, if you are subjecting yourself to repetitive listening fatigue, then you are destroying your hearing. And I don't care how much money next year you will spend on your stereo or how much money you are setting aside to upgrade your system. If you are destroying your hearing, your experience that you will get, even if you go 10 times as expensive or you win the lottery, it will not be nearly as good as if you had been taking good care of your ears and bought a modest stereo system. So thank you for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, do your homework, take care of your ears and enjoy listening to music. Bye-bye.